In this season of Extra Politics, we've covered systems and rules exploits that political players use to gain unfair advantages and what we might do to remedy that. But did you know, there's also a whole lot of other known exploits that have yet to be abused, at least as of this recording. And since we here at Extra Credits don't ascribe to the stick your head in the sand and hope for the best approach, we'd like to take the time to shine a light on these often not spoken of, but currently legal, game-breaking bugs, then present the government with some preemptive patch notes. So strap on a helmet and fire up your chainsword, that reference will make sense later, because the amount of possible exploits to battle is pretty significant. Now, some of the examples we're about to discuss may seem unfathomable at first glance. But keep in mind, most exploits and erosions of norms sound crazy until someone does them. We're looking at you, filibuster elimination, DOJ bullying, and whatever new fresh 2020 hexstorm has erupted between writing this episode and its release. Then after some time, such craziness is just considered clever or corrupt, depending on your viewpoint. So with all that in mind, let's kick off this grand tour of available exploits with the judicial branch. Because the Supreme Court is responsible for one of the biggest rules exploits of all time, judicial review. The ability to strike down a law by ruling it unconstitutional is not a constitution-given power. They actually granted it to themselves in the case of Marbury v. Madison and have wielded it ever since. And while this has been helpful in the past, as presidential candidates now campaign with lists of potential SCOTUS nominees, we have to admit that this branch of government is becoming increasingly partisan. So it's reasonable to imagine a day when the court acts no less partisan than the House, the Senate, or the President. A hyper-partisan Supreme Court could do some real damage. They could intervene in elections by creating recount requirements that favor their party, or be willing to certify an election based on fraudulent or inconclusive data. They could hold presidents of their own party to looser standards when it comes to claims of executive privilege and signing statements. And since our legal system is already so slow to resolve political issues, often taking years to reach a verdict, a partisan court could make that even worse. Because imagine a court that responded in weeks to issues affecting its party, but that didn't take up issues affecting the opposition for years or even ever. If the court got really radicalized, they have the power to make broad rulings to appease a political constituency any one of which could cause a domino effect of unintended consequences, which could get messy really quick. But jumping away from the Supreme Court for a moment, let's take a look at a branch of government whose job it is to get things done. The executive branch, which still has a tremendous amount of power that is yet to be exploited. Now you might be asking yourself, didn't we go over the executive branch back in episode 2? We sure did, friendos, but welcome to the new game plus of possible exploits. Because working around checks and balances is something the executive branch is really good at. For example, the president could decide to take the Defense Production Act for a spin. Intended for use during times of national crisis, this gives the president the power to force companies to make whatever products the president deems critical, allows the president to settle labor disputes, and can even put the president in control of real estate and consumer credit. And while those emergency powers are meant to save lives, all of those things could also be easily weaponized to punish or reward companies and individuals based on political support. The president also has the power to unilaterally use the Department of Justice to investigate and arrest political enemies, instruct the IRS to audit others, and selectively choose which international businesses can operate in the U.S. and under what terms. And there's more. Using a power clearly spelled out in legislation already on the books, the president could even order the Mint to print $1 trillion coins and use them to pay off the national debt in an afternoon. Hyperinflation be damned. And one of the most precedent-breaking things a president could do is simply ignore a SCOTUS ruling and state that they don't believe the courts have the right of judicial review. If Congress didn't impeach the president over this, the Supreme Court would essentially lose the power to rule laws unconstitutional going forward, and any law passed by Congress and signed by the president would become law with no checks on it if it were constitutional or not. And speaking of constitutional, we didn't forget about you, legislative branch. If they had enough votes to override a veto or a willing president, Congress legally could still really bring the chaos. For example, they could pass an updated Reapportionment Act, doubling the number of seats in the House of Representatives to 870. This would greatly reduce the power of smaller states, not only in the House, but because of the way electoral college votes are tallied, also in presidential elections. And this is clearly constitutional, as is changing the number of Supreme Court justices. Heck, Congress could, with the approval of the president, even sell Hawaii to get rid of their two senators if they wanted to. Sorry, Rob. 
And if the House and two-thirds of the Senate were all of one party, they could impeach and remove from office every circuit, district, and Supreme Court justice of any other party. And while this seems extreme, it's a power clearly written into the Constitution. We can't assume that any rule governing how Congress operates will stop exploits either, because both houses of Congress write their own rules at the start of each term and can update those rules with a simple majority vote whenever they want. Hooray democracy, I guess? 2020 has made it pretty clear that it's not a good idea to run a government by hoping that the better angels of its competitors will prevent known exploits from being used. So let's crack open the Codex Astartes for some good old-fashioned game design guidance on how to fix this, hopefully with giant shoulder pads. In 1987, Games Workshop introduced gamers to the miniature battle game Warhammer 40k. And over the next five years, they released 10 books of supplemental information, including new rules, units, factions, and scenarios. Throughout this process, bad rules snuck in, and they got abused by players. Then fights about rules interpretation became extremely common. And as often as not, games were won by the players who knew how to best exploit the rule set, and not the player who had the best strategy, based on the game's original intent. So Games Workshop responded with Warhammer 40k 2nd Edition in 1993. This release codified many of the best aspects of the previous version, streamlined the game, and plugged the known exploits. And of course, as future supplemental materials created different loopholes, new additions were needed to clean it up again, rinse and repeat. So why couldn't we try that with our government? I mean, really, in the last 200 plus years, our country's supplemental materials, laws, rulings, regulations, and structures have become so complex that political battles are no longer being won by the best idea, but by the person or team that's best at abusing the rules. And we don't need to start over. We just need to do what Warhammer did. Codify, streamline, and plug exploits. Whoa! <laughs> Sorry, I took the Warhammer 40k a little too far. But we codify by putting ideas that are widely agreed on directly into the Constitution. Let's do that with judicial review. Let's lock in the number of justices in the Supreme Court once and for all. Let's nail down the number of members in the House of Representatives in a more permanent way, or at least set a schedule and method for how and when it gets updated. We streamline by removing pointless barriers that waste everyone's time and money. Let's give Congress the power to appeal directly to the Supreme Court for clarity on important political issues. And while we're at it, let's put a three-month deadline on how long the Senate has to vote on senior political appointees and SCOTUS judges. And we plug our worst exploits by checking abusable power. Let's define limits of presidential signing statements and executive privilege. Let's add a layer of congressional approval to presidential pardons. Let's make changing the internal rules of Congress require a supermajority to slow down abuses. And let's limit the length of Supreme Court justices' terms so that the court is refreshed with new ideas regularly. Codify, streamline, and plug exploits. These are simple game design concepts, but for us to use them here, we need to have the courage to modify our Constitution, something as a nation we've been hesitant to do. In fact, it's been almost 50 years since the 26th Amendment gave 18-year-olds the right to vote, and the only amendment passed after that was written in the 1700s and took more than 200 years to be ratified. But since the Founders gave us clear rules on how to modify the Constitution, we should use them for their intended purpose, to continually work at making a better nation. As the father of our country, George Washington once wrote in a letter to his nephew, I do not think that we are more inspired, have more wisdom, or possess more virtue than those who will come after us. And on that note, while we were working on this episode, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Over her career, she improved countless lives as she fought for greater equality in our nation. But now, some of the exploits in this episode, ideas we thought were shockingly crazy, like packing the court and a new reapportionment act, are suddenly front and center in many political circles. And as of the recording of this episode, we don't know the long-term effects of RBG's passing and the breakneck speed in which her position was filled. But this situation highlights just how fragile our system is. The death of a single person, no matter how extraordinary, shouldn't be able to throw the most powerful nation in the world into crisis mode. And breakdowns like this are a direct result of our system not being patched and updated. So let's all work together, vote for change, and make sure our next edition is a lot more stable. You know, I hear there is a big election coming up. So on election day, we're hosting an all-night extra politics stream over on our Twitch channel. We'll be reviewing poll numbers, making predictions, and all hanging out together cordially discussing politics, and we'd love to have you there for the conversation. 
It all starts at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 3rd at twitch.tv slash extra credits and will be running until we either have the results or it's clear we won't get them for some time. Hope to see you there.